Welcome to Present Perfect. No grammar, but plenty of history. I'm Don Congdon, your host and guide, helping you explore how the past reaches out and touches the present. This is podcast number 115. Last time we left the English people on the verge of some major political and cultural changes. William the Conqueror had just invaded England and been crowned its new king. Along with short haircuts and a clean-shaven look, the Normans brought a new language along with them. An ancestor of modern French, it significantly influenced English, causing it to start developing into the language that we speak today. Soon, Anglo-Saxon would go the way of shaggy hair, beards, battle axes, and names like Ethelstane. Norman culture significantly changed England in other ways as well. When most people think of the Middle Ages, they usually imagine castles, knights in armor, courtly love, chivalry, and religious pomp. Many of these elements came across the channel with the Normans. At the same time, Europe as a whole was changing. The early Middle Ages gave way to the High Middle Ages. This was a time of great cultural richness. Art, literature, and intellectual pursuits expanded. Architecture expressed itself rather grandiosely through the monumental, multi-generational projects like the Gothic cathedrals. Nationalism began to assert itself, and the skeletons of modern nations started coming together. Times were good, so the population increased. The church, meanwhile, had come a long way since the days of the apostles. Barely recognizable, it had acquired numerous non-biblical doctrines and practices clerical celibacy, monasticism, purgatory, the adoration of Mary, and a confused path to salvation were all in place by this time. Instead of the relatively informal and loosely connected congregations of its early days, the church had become a megalithic organization with a large professional class of clergy controlling enormous wealth and power. The once reclusive hermit communities of the deserts had become powerful monastic orders. These provided a stabilizing influence on society and made numerous intellectual and social contributions, but they also bolstered many of the false doctrines that had come to dominate the church. The church itself had long since changed from a purely religious organization into a significant political power. While European kingdoms were ruled by their noble classes, the church itself had its own emperor who claimed to rule them all. He's been known by many titles, a few of which include the Bishop of Rome, Pontifex Maximus, the Vicar of Jesus Christ, and the one that most of us are familiar with, the Pope. The office of the Pope did not begin at any particular point in time. In the first few centuries of the church, the pastors of major urban congregations were called bishops. They were often addressed as father, which is papa in Latin. As the church in the city of Rome became more influential, its bishop wielded more and more power. With the fading of Roman influence and culture, the church began to move into the vacuum. If any man can be considered the first pope in the sense that we recognize it today, that man is probably Gregory, who was bishop of Rome from 590 to 604. Assuming power at a crucial time of political turmoil, Gregory's capable leadership replaced that of the Roman emperors. Himself the son of a senator, Gregory established many of the practices that would characterize the Church of the Early Middle Ages, including its love of the mystical. Throughout the High Middle Ages, the office of the Pope became increasingly powerful, essentially trumping all other powers. The Pope crowned kings and spoke authoritatively on matters of church doctrine. As a number of kings had learned, going against the Pope wasn't a bright idea. But as the 14th century opened, the situation in Europe began to deteriorate. Wars, poor harvests, and repeated outbreaks of the Black Death had reduced the population significantly. Increased nationalism was creating greater tensions between political entities and many saw the church as a major failure. The clergy had become greedy, luxurious, and corrupt, followers of wealth rather than of Christ. Many were indifferent teachers and pastors. Kings began to question the pope's right to interfere in non-religious matters. 
Things came to a head when Pope Boniface VIII declared that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. In other words, the Pope was over all other powers, and apart from him, there was no path to God. Annoyed at this challenge to his power, the French king, Philip IV, had a band of thugs imprison and starve the Pope for three days. Although he was eventually rescued, Boniface died not long afterwards from the stressful experience. The papacy itself became enmeshed in the gears of political machinations and for its own safety moved from Rome to the city of Avignon in France. For almost 70 years the popes were French rather than Roman. Some called this period in papal history the Babylonian captivity of the papacy, an allusion to Judah's 70-year time in Babylon. By the late 1300s things had gone from bad to worse. A new pope moved the papacy back to Rome, then another tried to move it back to Avignon. A rival pope was elected. At one point, three men all claimed to be the legitimate pope. This led to the Western Schism in which the emerging European powers aligned themselves with different popes, creating even greater political tension. The whole debacle eroded the Church's credibility and caused many to question whether it really did speak with the voice of God. Even after the matter was settled, a lot of bitterness remained. This is just a quick thumbnail sketch of conditions at the beginning of the late Middle Ages. In a future podcast series, I intend to discuss this time period in far greater detail, but for now, I've given you enough to establish the historical context. It is within this turbulent time that we meet our next English Bible. And with it, we meet a rather curious man who was, perhaps an innocent, perhaps a master playing powerful men against each other, but most certainly a scholar and a lover of God's Word, John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a pure academic with a knack for somehow becoming involved in high politics. Educated at the University of Oxford, Wycliffe spent most of his life there in various academic capacities. We know that two early experiences altered his life's trajectory the Black Death of 1348, and a major riot in 1355 between the townspeople of Oxford and the student body. The deaths associated with these events, as well as the corruption that he saw within the church, made Wycliffe believe that the end of the world was near. The more he studied the Bible, the more Wycliffe became convinced that the church was on the wrong tack. At first, he focused on the failings of the clergy and the church's overall greed and incompetence. But as time went by, he started to question some of the church's doctrinal positions as well. He began to write tracts condemning various practices and doctrines. In some, he expressed the belief that the secular government had the right to preempt the church's authority if the church became evil or corrupt. This position earned Wycliffe friends in high places since it proved popular with the nobility who were mostly anti-clerical. John of Gaunt, son of the English king Edward III, liked Wycliffe's position as well as his articulateness. This liking led to his patronizing Wycliffe and protecting him from the English church authorities who began to strike back. On several occasions, they attempted to bring Wycliffe to trial for heresy, but were thwarted each time in a variety of unusual ways. Whether Wycliffe was naive or clever, his favored position with the nobility, as well as Oxford's jealousy for its academic freedom, gave him a lot of latitude to express himself. Many speak of Wycliffe as a precursor of the Reformation, which happened almost 150 years later. But his doctrinal views were probably not as advanced as those that the Reformers of the 16th century held. Nevertheless, it appears that he was moving in the right direction. In one area, however, Wycliffe was definitely aligned with a principle that would come to be strongly associated with the Reformation. This was the belief that the Bible should be translated into the languages in common use. Doing so would make it accessible to anyone who wished to read it. Near the end of his life, Wycliffe's increasing attacks on widely held church doctrines lost him the support of John of Gaunt. His name was also unfairly associated with a revolt by the peasant class in 1381. Despite a few near misses with church authorities, however, Wycliffe died peacefully of a stroke in 1384. 
Somewhat amusingly, several decades later, the church declared him a heretic, exhumed his bones, and burned them, symbolically doing what they had been unable to do in Wycliffe's lifetime. I imagine Wycliffe wouldn't have much cared. Okay, let's talk about the Bible that goes by Wycliffe's name. From what we can tell, it was translated during the last few years of his life. Although it's been called Wycliffe's Bible for most of its history, we have no idea how much of it he actually translated. Most scholars assume that Wycliffe started the translation project and supervised it, working with a small team of friends and fellow academics. It's possible that the New Testament is his work. Because the quality of its translation is different, however, it's likely that the Old Testament is the work of another team member. Nicholas of Hereford is considered the most likely possibility. After Wycliffe's death, another collaborator, John Purvey, produced a revision that was a bit more readable. Since Wycliffe's Bible came about 60 years before the introduction of movable type printing, each one was hand-copied, making them costly. Despite this fact, between 150 and 250 survived today, so evidently a fair number were produced. The Wycliffe Bible is a translation of the Latin Vulgate into Middle English. It is therefore a translation of a translation. In Wycliffe's day, Western European scholars did not study Hebrew or Greek, so the Bible's original languages would have been inaccessible to them. This situation would change in the near future, but it explains the reason that Wycliffe's team used the Latin Vulgate as the source text. Overall, the translation isn't as readable as it could be since Wycliffe's team retained the Latin word order as much as possible. Purvey's revision is a bit better. In the late Middle Ages, illiteracy was fairly common, so Wycliffe's Bible would not have been particularly useful to ordinary people but he encouraged young men to become what came to be called poor priests. They would travel the country preaching and teaching in English and using the English Bible text rather than the traditional Latin. Many of these were laymen, that is, they were not ordained by the church. Their educational backgrounds varied widely, but they were united by Wycliffeite views and a focus on the Bible. The church derisively labeled them lollards, which probably means mumbler. Many were persecuted and some gave their lives for their faith, but their work undoubtedly laid the groundwork for the Reformation of the next century. While the church reviled Wycliffe, it had mixed feelings about his Bible. Because it's a fairly unbiased translation from Latin into Middle English, it doesn't have a strong reform feel to its language. Consequently, the church really couldn't take exception to the text itself. Instead, they fastened on the notion that its production was unauthorized. Despite this, however, even Orthodox clergymen sometimes used Wycliffe Bibles to aid them if their Latin skills weren't all that they should have been. While the church officially disapproved of this Bible, it still saw a lot of use prior to the Reformation. As we finish up, let's take a brief look at the English of Wycliffe's day. As I've said, it is now called Middle English because it lies between Old English and our modern form of the language. It incorporated quite a few French words and constructions on top of the existing Anglo-Saxon grammar and vocabulary. Consequently, the language changed, becoming more dependent on word order and less on inflections. Many regional variations of Middle English were spoken. Two men's work helped to stabilize and standardize Middle English. One you've just met. The other you may have heard of if you've encountered his Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer was a friend and later brother-in-law of John of Gaunt. Through his powerful connections, Chaucer achieved a stable living and was able to write the works for which he is known today. His pen helped people to realize that great works of literature could be written in languages other than Latin. Incidentally, some Chaucer scholars believe that the parson of the Canterbury Tales is a Lollard. He's certainly one of the most positive figures in that sprawling series of tales. If you should happen to encounter an example of Middle English, you'll probably be able to muddle through it. Unlike Anglo-Saxon, Middle English is mostly understandable to our modern ears. Get past the odd accent, the unfamiliar vocabulary, and its eccentric spelling, and you'll recognize it as the obvious ancestor of your own language.
Let's close with a passage of Middle English from Wycliffe's Bible. Again, I'll read from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was at Goda, and Goda was the Word. This was in the beginning at Goda. All a thing is wherein mod be him, and withouten him was mod no thing, that thing that was mod. Next time, we're going to prepare to leave the Middle Ages and enter the beginnings of our modern world. But before we explore the next major Bible landmark, we're going to discuss Bible manuscripts a bit more. We're about to enter a rich time of translation, so we'll require a deeper understanding of the source texts first. So until next time, I'm Don Congdon and this is Present Perfect. Have a great day. Present Perfect is a copyright of Don Congdon. Music is copyright footage firm incorporated. Scripture quotations are from the New American Standard Bible, which is a copyright of the Lachman Foundation.